today's session, we welcome Rebecca Bright from London. She is the co-founder of Therapy Box, and she is going to tell us all about Predictable and Seen and Heard Pro. The handouts for this session are available at this bit.ly link, and I will put that into the chat box for you. I am going to stop sharing, and I'm going to turn that over to Rebecca. Thank you so much for that. That's uh, that's great. Um, I think you can see my slides now too. Is that yes. yeah, yeah, well, great. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on me, just before I start, which might help with a bit of context behind what we do at Therapy Box, um, I'm a, a speech language therapist or a speech pathologist by background. Actually, I, I um, I'm from Australia originally and um, graduated in. Um, with my speech pathology degree back in 2001 um, and uh, then worked clinically for, for quite a long time before starting Therapy Box back in about 2010 um, and in the time since then have, um, you know, we've, we develop AAC apps but we also um, work with universities, um, publishers, um, different UN departments on uh, projects related to um, building tech for speech um, language and cognition um, so that's what we do and I'm um, I'm taking sort of a semi sabbatical from therapy box at the moment because I've just started working on my PhD uh, here in London at University College London so I'm uh, look, looking at um, social participation uh, dementia and hearing loss so um, that's a little bit about me, but uh, Therapy Box is is um, uh, sort of 12, 13 years old now, and we've got two main apps, and that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Please feel free to interrupt as I go. I'm happy to be interrupted. Let's see. Okay. So I've, um, I'm going to talk first about Seen and Heard Pro, which is actually brand new. Um uh, and predictable, uh, sort of 10, 11 years old, but I'll talk about Seen and Heard Pro first. Um, it came out earlier in 2023. It's um, an augmentative communication aid, but specifically um, it's uh, a visual scene display approach to, to AAC. So um, I, I don't know how familiar everybody is with that approach, but it's, a, it's an approach that uses images or photos to represent somebody's uh, context, so re their real life environment, um, using photos typically of their environment. So instead of a grid based setup, the the display really is a photo, um, which um, cater to their individual um, personality, their needs. Um, their communication abilities, their communication preferences, and um, you know, and and offer quite a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can communicate. Um, we um, spent a large part of last year working with the RERC on AAC um, to uh, look at some of the research that they had done, and, and a big remit of the of that of that group. Um, is to support research being transitioned into to real life technology. So this is a great opportunity for that. Um, so uh, we looked at some of their work on transition to literacy, video visual scene displays, and the general um, approaches to just-in-time programming um, to make sure that we were an evidence-based or an evidence-informed uh, app. So I'll talk as I talk through some of the features. Uh, I'll mention that further. But um, the research that underpins the feature development is so listed in the app as well. So Seen and Heard Pro, um, as I said, the idea is you take a photo and then you add a hotspot. And by hotspot, I mean sort of an active area on the on the screen. So in this case, the photo would be likely say of this young girl at the gardening center or in a 
um, you know, in the, in the UK, we have allotments where you can, you know, do community gardening. It looks like it's a bit like that. And uh, I can draw a hotspot. So in this case, that purple um, outline on things I want to attach a message to or um, have some content activated. So it could be really simple. I might just want to um, draw this purple circle, purple shape around, so let's say it's me, and I can say, I love gardening, or last week I went gardening. It really doesn't matter what the message is, that somebody can support this girl to record um, to be able to, to then share at that time or later when reflecting on what they've been um, what they've been doing. So, oh, let's see if this little video might work, actually. Here you go. So this is how I do it. I've drawn a circle on the, um, around the pencils. It's formed a shape. Let me, there we go. I'm drawing a picture around the girl. And then up pops a little modal where I can then record some audio. Um, so I think I recorded, you know, I love drawing or something like that. And I can add other things to it too. I can add the transition to literacy feature. I can link to another scene. Um, I can, you know, can do loads of things. But the idea is that I can create... Today at school, I drew some pictures with my pencils. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I drew a lovely picture of my house. I don't know, if, could you hear that? Did that audio come through? Yeah, great. Did, so, yeah. And I can link to another scene as well. So, yeah, it's super, super simple to be able to create that. And I'll just, let me bring it back to where... It, um, where I show you, yeah. So you know, the really the it can be as simple as just recording some audio, but you can click on the advanced editing or additional editing, and then open up a full menu of other things you can do. So you can either use um, voice output that can either be text to speech. So I could type in the message. So that need not be in English. That could be in any language be, that the iPad has a, a voice engine for, which is loads. Or I could record the audio myself or have someone else record it. Um, or, um, you know, it's it's really flexible in that way. I can attach a video to that. So it might be, in this case, it might have been a video of me drawing or, you know, showing you the artwork on the wall or, um, you know, a, a video. It could be anything. It really doesn't matter. I can transition. I can do the transition to literacy feature, which I'll show you in a minute. I can link to another scene. So if I had another scene, which was the art final artwork, or I had another scene that was um, me doing the next activity, I can I can link that as well. I can also add a little label to the hotspot if that's useful for some uh, for some individuals. So that's how you create it. It's really simple. It doesn't need any training or you know it, it's sort of up and running. And then I can also create video visual scenes. And this differs um, in so far as that instead of having a photo as the base, you have a video. And the challenge here is then to find um, good opportunities to add a, a static scene, just like the, the visual scenes we had just before. So if I this is a video, for example, of young a young man in a garden center going about um label you know creating a list of of plants and so i can kind of splice that video where it's appropriate to add um static uh or you know freeze frame of that video and then add hot spots on that freeze frame and so the nice thing is that helps provide um uh, contextual prompts but also the temporal nudge really of where those communication opportunities might exist within a in a more you know in a more dynamic environment um, and so a lot of the work that went into to developing this feature um, was in a consultation with David McNaughton and it's re and I think it's really about finding ways to support communication but also independence and participation. So I think thinking about those three things together and not in isolation. So um, it's not just about, you know, being able to ask for help, but it might be about, you know, working out what the next step is in a process. So um, it might be used in um, supported workplace type activities, 
uh, or procedural type tasks. Um, it could be used in neuro rehab. It could be used in the classroom. You know, it's really um, designed to be quite flexible. And you can add those scenes. So the scenes then sit down the bottom as little those little snapshots or freeze frames where you have content on them. And you can navigate by tapping on those directly. Um, and you can add more and you can take them out as well. So you could always have quite a lot of communicative prompts <laughs> or a whole lot of scaffolding really sitting along the bottom and then take those out as you, as you didn't need them. So that's creating video uh, visual scenes. But you can also create a grid with Scene and Herd. So we do have the capability for you to add in uh, like a cell setup uh, and you can either add in um, symbols and we have a, our own little symbol library within the app or you can add in photos. So I've um, uh, got a few examples where instead of, instead of having these symbols, for example, you could have the, um, the, the, the pictures that you then use in subsequent visual scenes. So these are sort of acts as a choice board or a landing, another version of the landing page for scenehood to navigate to, um, uh, you know, making a choice. Okay, so this is the, um, I'm going to just pause the video so I can explain it before we start. So this is the transition to literacy feature. Uh, and this, as I said, um, came about through our um, uh, consultation from the RERC, and in particular from Janice Light, um, looking at how we could embed the um a module to support the transition to literacy approach. So um, the idea is that you can embed opportunities for exposing a child to, or an, or an adult, uh, I suppose, to um, uh, sight words or decodable words um, using the, using an approach that they've used before in quite a lot of their studies. Um, and as I said, we referenced some of those in the app itself, so you can go and read more on them. Um, but the idea is that you can provide opportunities to an AEC user to, or to a visual scene display user in accessing or being exposed to um, uh, sight words and decodable words. So this is how you create. Uh, here I show you how to do a decodable word. The picture is a boy playing football, uh, soccer, by the way, so... So you add in phoneme by phoneme, or you could do syllable by syllable. Um, and I'm recording, I don't know if you can hear it in the video, but I'm recording each of those phonemes separately. And then I record kick as a, uh, as a word too. So when the person comes along to use it in the visual scene, they can, they, and if, if transition to literacy is turned on, they can tap it and then they're presented with. <laughs> e. <laughs> Kick. And uh, this approach is is, is um, as I said, based on 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 the work that the RERC on AEC did. You know, including that it's yellow on black, the timings and so on. So it's um, uh, fairly true to to the research that they've done to date. So, um, you know, I'm really interested to to hear more about how people might be able to use uh, this in the classroom or with children. Um, using AC and in particular using visual scene displays. And Rebecca, um, can you can you tell me what is the R E R C? Okay. Yes, that? sure. <laughs> I'm. I, I mean, I'm really. I'm not always great with acronyms. I think it's the. Oh, I'm gonna have to, let me. I'm gonna Google it and and tell you before the end of the session. But it's something like the research. Oh, lovely Kelly Fawner has helped us out here. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Yes. Oh, perfect. There's the link. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a, a funded group of uh, of researchers with, and they've got different sort of work packages with it within that, looking at different aspects of AAC and visual and um, visual scene displays is a, is is quite a key part of the work they've done. Um, and you know, it's a number of years of of research that 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 sort of sits behind that. Um. Okay, so another feature which um, we have is the visual timetable. 
uh, which is great because you can then schedule the scenes that you want. So you can access the scenes either through the main page where you've got folders and subfolders and you can tap on the scenes you want, or you can access them through this visual timetable where I can um, pop the scenes on certain times that make sense for them to appear. Uh, and then I can come and access them through um, through that time uh, link. So at nine o'clock, if every if on Mondays and Wednesdays we have a circle time or you know some uh, songs, I can put that there. If at twelve o'clock, three days of the week, I'm at the garden center, I can run that across there. Or I go shopping on Thursday. Those scenes can sit within the. Um, you know, within the within the timetable, and I can access them by tapping on them that way. I can also create a communication book with the various scenes I have. So I could make a huge number of scenes, but I might only want to choose four of them to then print out and have as a low tech version of what I have, um, or to just have as a topical book. Like you know, it might be I don't know winter holidays or um, you know a particular class and have my have things arranged that way as well so I can um, print that out and I can also share the scenes so if I had scenes that were applicable to other people I could share a scene for them to use um, as well like maybe a festive scene that or you know a class-based scene you know a teacher could easily share that between uh, his or her students uh, you can buy um seen and heard pro on the app store or the play store so it's available also on android uh including on chromebooks and uh yeah on ipads and you can either do a subscription or you can or an upfront purchase um and i'm really if you want i'm gonna say how many people yeah let me find if you want i'll give you all a copy so you've all got a copy so um i will um send over that information after this but i'll make sure you all have a copy because i think it's brand new and the more i can get it out to people the more other people will see it so let me um get it to you and i think the thing we've seen and heard is the more you start using it the more you understand how to use it. i think it, it, the, that whole approach the visual scene display approach is sometimes uh not so obvious how, as to how it will best be used by by different um, patient groups or client groups but once it's sort of once you have your hands on it people go oh I get it <laughs> and I'm using it with this person and this person and um you know so it's I think it's something that um is really useful to have a copy of so I'll send that out to to everybody right I'm moving on now to uh predictable uh, and predictables um now it was launched in January 2011 so we're coming up for 13 years old um uh, for predictable and it's it's a, an app for a very different um uh, type of AAC um user oh I can see um Kim has her hand up let me <laughs> thank you Rebecca I just had a quick question thank you so much for offering the free version of seen and heard I've used I used it many many years ago and it was mm. much simpler yep, yep. I'm really excited about the new things um but I was just wondering in general, just for as we're talking to other therapists, does Therapy Box tend to offer a free like free um, samples to um, speech language pathologists who do evaluations? What's the yep. general approach to that? Yeah, so our, our approach to it is, um, yes, we offer apps to anybody who does evaluations, but we also we offer that, um, we ask that people come and do either a session like this, if we have, or they come along and do, we have a bookable um, slot. Um, and we can and we can also do a roundabout this time as well. We usually we have one a bit earlier in the day, which might be too early for you, but um, where the, we ask them to come along for a half an hour, sort of chat through the app so that we feel that people have the, have have a, a good grasp on it and then we'll give people um uh, evaluator copies that they can use we also um can uh, provide sh um shorter term access for people um who might want to trial it out as well so if you do want to do that you can let us know we can help on a case by case basis to do that and that to that session we have each day is also open to 
parents, carers, people using ASC. And we, we have, you know, it can be used for troubleshooting. It can be used for training. It can be used for, you know, I've got this app now. What I'm, How can I make sure I'm getting the most out of it? So we just, we sort of have that open slot that we try to um keep available for people which which because we're not a big company with reps going around and we you know we've no one in the US and we, you know so we try to find ways to um get our app out to as many people as possible but make sure that we can support people with it rather than just sending out codes that may you know that may or may not be useful for somebody that's great yeah that makes a lot of sense thank you okay good uh so yes yeah, to predictable so Predictable. I'm going to talk about Predictable Seven because it's coming out very early in the new year. If um, we'll, we'll be at um, ATIA in the end of January in Orlando, and that'll hopefully be its big. Um, that'll be its first outing, um, uh, and that's how that's how rush towards the end of the year for all the developers getting Predictable Seven ready. So uh, the original version came out in 2011, uh, and it's really designed for people with motor speech difficulties primarily but uh, is being used more and more by a, a broader range of people including people with um, you know people in ICU people uh, post laryngectomy people post stroke um, and also people who uh, increasingly a, a large group of people who have um, speech some of the time or don't always feel comfortable speaking uh, autistic uh, teenagers and adults probably the larger group who, uh, who, who I'm referring to um, and then uh, younger users uh, ch children with cerebral palsy down syndrome you know a range of, of of needs where they manage a text-based system because predictable is uh, primarily uh, keyboard oriented um, and it's really been designed and we continue to have this as our key uh, goal with predictable is to be able to reduce keystrokes or switch hits and get messages out as quick as possible. Um, we try to find ways for efficiencies to, you know, to on every button, you know, does this need to be two taps? That how can we get this back to one tap? We want to make everything um, as economic in terms of use as possible for somebody, because typically the people who use predictable. Uh, if they have significant motor speech difficulties, uh, you know, it's quite likely that they have other uh, issues, you know, with, with their upper limb um, or other, you know, other, other needs as well. So it's, it's a keyboard, primarily a keyboard app, uh, but there's also ways to save messages for quick access. So um, I'll show you that as well. This is the, um, the main screen. This is predictable seven. You're, you're getting a sneak preview of um and the prediction strip sits across the the middle of the the screen um and uh works locally on the device so you don't need to be online um however in seven predictable seven with some of the additional uh bilingual languages you will need to be online but we'll 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 um, flag up which ones those are um, but as I said a keyboard based app and you you can speak the message. You can share it out on 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 iMessage or make a FaceTime call. You have loads of different uh, options as to how you do that. And really, the idea is that you can customize um, everything <laughs> uh, about Predictable to suit your personality, but also most importantly to uh, suit your access needs, your sensory um requirements your motor um abilities so you, everything can be customized in terms of color uh, and font and so on uh a question from kim yeah i'm just wondering um rebecca uh does it go in landscape mode or portrait mode it does yes yes it's it's in both um and on iPhone as well, and watch, and uh, and on Android um, in landscape and portrait as well. Thank you. And um, it ha offers. We offer currently in Predictable Six. We have twenty seven secondary languages. 
and we have that will go up to 40 plus secondary languages and we have 10 core languages as in like there is predictable which is predictable english so it's for, for the uk with the uk and the us uh, word prediction engine but you can within that to a secondary language um if you're bilingual or multilingual you can so you can switch to for example you can have running english and french english and spanish english and arabic and um those 10 core languages are you know are predictable english predictable uh french spanish norwegian danish Norwe um finnish swedish dutch german portuguese um, and there'll also be Hebrew and Arabic and Italian added to the core bunch of languages. But there are 40 plus languages as secondary languages for each of those. So you could have French and Arabic or French and um, Hindi, uh, Mandarin and so on. So um, it will that will op really open up the 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 app to a whole lot of people who may not have access to um AC um as as their secondary languages um in predictable seven so so we're hoping to be able to um you know make that more accessible for for more people oh here's the language I was here I was trying to remember them all so here are, these are the 40 new these are the 40 languages that'll sit as second languages in predictable English for example so uh quite a few um there and I, I don't know for example in the UK I'll after English, the the languages most often spoken are Polish, um, some of the Indian languages, and Arabic, Russian. So that we've, that um, that helps a lot of people who who wouldn't, didn't otherwise have access um, to to those languages. Uh, another brand new thing in Predictable Seven uh, is that we are going to have symbol supported messages. So the word prediction can have symbols turned on. Um, to run alongside um, the word prediction and that will appear in the message window and the symbols also in the phrase bank. Um, you saw the phrase bank a little bit in this picture here in, in I think it's in, or oh, I'm not sure which language it, is. it looks like Russian, I think, uh, over to the side there. Uh, so, you know, but, the, but in English, obviously you can, you, you know, that'll all be, that's all symbol supported as well. Um, we offer um, a rate, we offer all of the iOS, voices um and that's a huge number of voices that are available on the ipad or on whichever android device you're using as well and then we're also compatible with the four major voice banking engines um speak unique model talker acapella and voice keeper um so people can uh, bank their voice if they know they're going to lose it and then um use it if they need it later on for example if they have als or or another neurodegenerative condition or somebody can uh donate their voice and be a proxy voice for, for somebody who's who hasn't had that opportunity to bank their voice uh, and it's also compatible with the apple's personal voice which they launched earlier in the year as well um so you have a range of voices and you can adjust um, a whole lot of the the settings about how that works within predictable and there's going to be some, there's going to be uh, other features I can tell you about. It's going, there's going to be a, a new feature which you will need to be online for, which is um, to access Chat GPT. So people could, for example, uh, seek support to generate of for, for, through Chat GPT. So the, the, to have an AI generated uh, text come up on their screen, and they can select whether they want that to then be spoken out. So they can ask you know pop in a prompt that they want a support from chat gpt on so that's an online feature that will be possible there'll also be a translate feature so uh, i don't know if i was if i had a carer perhaps who spoke a language other than the one i spoke um, i could use the translation feature to translate my message on my message window to into their language and there'll be loads of different um, new themes and looks <laughs> Um, that you can use as templates as well and in addition the, there's going to be updates to the eye tracking so at the moment you can use the eye tracking with either the toby td pilot on the ipad or the iRespond hero on the ipad 
you can use it with face and then you can use it with um with the ipad itself you can use head tracking and and uh, face gestures as well so there's more work um that's gone into that as well in predictable seven uh and really that's uh what I want to tell you about Predictable, um, but you're, you're welcome to to contact us a, a, about it if you want. And as I said, we do have that training session available, um, that sort of open open uh, office hours uh, that you can you can always book into too. Yeah, I'm happy to to answer any questions either about Seen and Heard Pro or about um, Predictable. Wow, those are some really neat features. Um... I know that I have not heard uh, from some of the other uh, vendors that we've had on um, the range of access, actually, that you guys had. I know you mentioned um, face, uh, mm -hmm. face tracking, and um, there was there was a company, I, it, one of the big companies like Microsoft or something like that, that had done like the facial gesture mm -hmm. um, recognition to control some sort of a gaming unit. Uh, and that was, that was pretty wild. And I haven't heard anybody else really talk about that. So that's really neat. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's, and we're, there's, we're adding in more face gestures than we've had before in the update, but you know, there's lots of lovely um, things we can do where you can sort of create a recipe of a combination of face gestures. So you could have blink, blink, blink equals, um, you know, select on your scanning pattern if you, if you, you know, where you might have previously used a switch. Or you could have blink, blink, blink equals hello or it equals, you know, this message. Um, and, you know, that can be... Uh, face gestures using eyebrows or it can be you know mouth-based face facial gestures as well eyebrow raises eye closes blinks uh, and so on so there's quite a few uh combinations that are that are possible wow okay um and then the incorporation of chat gpt for communication i mean that's that's amazing i just think that's amazing yeah, it's a really interesting one because we're trying to think about how to best do it because it, what's really important, I think, is that, of course, somebody needs to not not just automatically play whatever comes out of chat GPT, but you might want to, you know, like if somebody says to you, um, oh, what does the RERC stand for? And, you know, and I could ask chat GPT and it give you a little blurb and I can say, yes, actually, I want to say all of that or I want to say the first two lines and speak that aloud. So I still have agency over what I'm saying, but it's probably, you know, I don't think it, I think that's sort of how we're communicating now. You know, I'm often pulling up things and saying, here's, you know, what's, you know, how do you make, you know, how do you, uh, you know, how do you make a chocolate cake? You know, whatever it might be, you, you know, you can pull that up and have that really quickly and participate in a different way um, where a longer message is, is what you want to provide or a different type of message that is what you want to provide or you're not copying and pasting something from a Google search outside and bringing it into your app. So I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, it's something new and I'm not sure how people will use it really. It'd be really interesting to to gather feedback once once we trial it. I know it's a, a huge discussion here in Oregon about um, having kids use AI in school just in general. I imagine it's not isolated here, right? It's all over the right. world, I'm sure. Um, so then just to incorporate that uh, for everyone, you know, and making it inclusive is is amazing. Mm, yeah, exactly. And there's lots of questions we don't have answers to. And, um, you know, we're not saying it's going to pe people will generate their messages solely on that or, you know, people still have to have agency over what they're selecting and choosing. But generally somebody and, and it can be a feature that is turned off by if, so for example, a child was using it, predictable, it is a feature that can be turned off and, you know, managed <laughs> um, as a, as for all the online features. They can all be sort of um, turned off um, and password protected so that they're not accessing them. Um, but for, you know, a lot of people who use predictable, for example, you know, adults are able to 
who have mental capacity to consent to to using it and have you know full act you know want to have full access um then you know that then they're able to to use it and it'll be really as i said interesting i don't, we don't really know how people will use it um i'll be interested to to observe um and so both of these are on the ipad right and on android as well yep and and on android okay um is there any uh, any push to get that on like a, a PC? Um, for us, I think we're we're happy to sort of stick to two, be, to both to iOS and Android, because um, you know we're a small team, and that means that we can uh, keep a uh, keep an eye on what we're doing, and I think uh, you know extending further out might be might be a risk for us. That makes sense. Um, and I, I see predictable, like you said, is available on the smartwatch. It will be, yes, the new set for predictable seven. So when you get it on your iPad or iPhone, you can also use it on the watch to to tap on messages on there as well. Okay, that's very neat. All right. Let's uh Hey guys, what kind of questions do you have about this program? You guys know what you do way better than I do. <laughs> so <laughs> jump on in and, and uh, uh, we do have in the folder, um, she did fill out the matrix for you guys. And then I will take that and transfer it into the master for you so that we we keep that updated um i'd love to i guess i i'd love to hear about kind of like a real life example of you know how how seen and heard in particular i think my kid um my daughter is on the spectrum um she's she's 23 now but when she was younger, I know um, transitions were just such a difficult thing and uh, new social environments. And um, I see like seen and heard and some other visual um, AAC apps. That's really like where I see those being used the best, right? Um can you can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and um, the, when the original version came, I've seen and heard the old version came out in twenty thirteen. Um, again, I think that was the the feedback that we've had over those sort of ten years, and with the new version is well, that's exactly the sort of um, uh, place that it's being used or the or opportunity where it's being used um, for also sending information home between school and home um for people to pop on um sort of social story type approach <laughs> excuse me as well <laughs> sorry and uh so it, it's it it's really been something i think that parents have um have taken to um and the idea of building the scenes with the person who needs it, I think is really important for having them choose where the hot spots go, the, the things that they want to talk about in the scene um, is important. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, there, there are, I've got a, we've got a little Udemy course we've put out actually this last week. And one of the things I do is go through 20 ideas for using it. Cause as I said, I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's the challenge is, you know, have, getting it in your hands. They're going, oh, okay, I could try it for this. And then having, uh, thinking about ways you could use it on, you know, on the fly. Um, Because it's not something you typically, you know, you need to prepare, you know, well in advance. It might be as, you know, just before you start the activity or, uh, or add an activity, but for the next time that activity happens, um, you know, if it's swimming every Tuesday, maybe it's then make, making the, the scene this this Tuesday for next Tuesday it's it's all about um you know trying to 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 spot those opportunities I think 
Um, so I'm kind of, I'm looking at the, the matrix and just kind of going through it a little bit, um, as far as voice output, it looks like you can pretty much do anything you want. <laughs> um, and again, the foreign languages, that's amazing. And I mean, I don't use an AAC app, but I'm thinking to myself, like, I could use, I could use that. I could travel to another country and I could use that, you know, and translate into another language. You have a whole new market there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yeah, we're, we're, as I said, we're really keen to try and open up, um, you know, AAC access to people who's, first or second language isn't traditionally served by an AAC app um, and provide opportunities, but also, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I live in London. It's, it's incredibly multicultural and talk to people that, you know, and uh, I had lunch today and people were, you know, chatting in Italian to the, uh, to the barista. Uh, and, you know, it's, 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 you know, people in, it's a very cosmopolitan city. Um, and people come in and out of languages all the time. And, and um, you know, we want to be able to support that sort of communication and not just not it be so static. And while it's not at the point where you can really code switch and, you know, blend in between your languages, as, as many people do, we at least want to facilitate the ability to, um, you know, have access to, to the different voices and um, be able to do that. I know we do have a, a large... Um... Spanish speaking population and um and sometimes that's their first language and sometimes that's just the language that they speak at home and they need to be able to go mm. back and forth. And so I don't um I don't I haven't noticed a whole lot of that being able to the translation mm. part. That's that's neat. And I, I could be wrong. There could be lots of other apps that do that. I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah no it's it's something we we feel quite passionate about and um uh the 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 need i i think really you can't i mean if you're bilingual and you you get you get given an english aac system then what do you use at home you know you shouldn't ha you, i you know i think there's a really a right and a responsibility to offer you know to offer aac in any language you know i think you know i don't, I don't know but in the uk for example a lot of our guidelines uh from our profession but uh, from our health service and the, the education system are that you know you need to provide an, an equitable and um, accessible uh, system so I think it's not really just a nice to have it it's, it's something that really we should all be um, put you know provisioning. Uh, Kim here says that uh, the visual scene displays have been great for adults with acquired communication disabilities post-stroke Yes, I think I, I think that's that's a that's a great point. Um, I know we're we're all education based and and we're we usually are dealing with kids, but I know that um, as we as we get older, our our parents and and whatnot or have these sorts of issues and grandparents. Uh, my father had a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, in this last year and so yeah that would definitely be something that we might use my sister is a is a preschool teacher and so one of our conversations post stroke was let's get him an AAC device let's let's get that in there um, and get it set up so that he can start start talking to us again right yep yeah and, you know, and that's uh, when we st started the business too, it's one of our, you know, I think that AC needs to be accessible in the, in the sense of it being easily accessed by families and affordable and, and, you know, for people to be able to go and sort things out themselves, you know, when we live in the UK, it's, we're fortunate our health service all will, should provide for, for, for that, but, you know, uh, it's not always the case. And so uh, you're right, being able to go and, have an AC app easily available for someone in, you know after a stroke or um for you know to families should also have you know some ability to be able to access that themselves I think uh and then 
Kelly's typed in here that visual scenes are also used widely in early intervention. If, yes, of course, yeah, with emergent communicators of all ages and in the past five years, growing research at OHSU Melanie Bride mm -hmm. Oaken and out of University of Nebraska for using visual scene displays with post-stroke aphasia and dementia. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's really key is that it's really a lot, an opportunity across the lifespan to introduce visual scenes. And um, it's, you know, there's, there's, there's loads of work, particularly in, in the area of aphasia, but also conversation support people with, with dementia. Um, and I think some of the work that Janice Light's done, that the children are as young as two uh, in her studies looking at using visual scene displays effectively. Um, which yeah, so there's lots of lovely research in in that area, and happy to to share some references um, if that's useful. Uh, and then Kelly mentions that the the companies outside of the U.S. are more focused on multiple languages than we are here, which I find funny since we're like a melting pot, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I don't know why either. Um, but the, the UK, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I living in London, it feel it's in, it's incredibly um, multicultural, um, and so, so it's certainly a big push here. Um, and it's been, as I said, it's, it, I think there's it, there's got guidelines and policies around uh, provisioning in in these languages, and a big big push. Um, I don't know about Australia either, you know, which is where I'm from. That whether there's such a push, perhaps not, but um, here there definitely is. I know that in March we will have a um, a rep on from Avaz, and they're based in India, and and they also have a large um, offering of languages. So, yeah, they do, don't they? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's kind of a big focus. <clears throat> All right. Let's... Um, Re Rebecca, this is Kim again. I have more of a. Uh boring logistical question <laughs> not um very good love it <laughs> <laughs> um just uh one other um person from the AT lab team that I'm part of is here but I'd love for the whole team to actually dig in a little more with some of these features is it best just to go to your website and do that book a training if we wanted to just yeah you know, have a little team walk through of some of these new features definitely and you can um yeah we can set up a time that suits your team if that if the time on the website doesn't suit just uh, message me and i can we can find a good time for you to do that okay is um, and is your are you the one who interfaces with that training schedule normally or? yeah normally yeah thank you yeah or you can try our new um udemy course that when i when i went out this week um but that's uh, you even you get a little you know it's a forty five minute introduction to scene and heard pro and we go through it in quite a lot of detail. If you want to try that as well, which which one is that? Did you say it's is that on the Udemy? On Udemy, which is you know like a platform for delivering courses, and it, um, uh, we have a little course on there. And the reason it's there actually because we saw Avas had a course on there too. Thought, oh, that's a good idea. So we've put out uh, we've put one out on there as well. So, um, I can I can um provide the link later if that's useful thank you i know my my esd just um signed us the whole organization up for udemy so i'm gonna go check that out okay, <laughs> <good. Yep. laughs> yeah that'll be interesting um so as far as trainings on your website do you have just kind of some ready made videos that are easily accessed. Yeah, there's loads of stuff on, on our YouTube channel um, and on the website. Um, and yeah, we try to keep those fairly up to date. So yeah, no, they're, they're readily available. People can access them as and when. Okay, excellent. Um let's see what else do we have here the eye gaze 
So you have a question mark next to eye gaze for seen and heard pro. Mm. What's yeah. So um, I think in theory, it should all work fine. We just, we haven't done a great deal of testing on it. So I just didn't want to um, okay. declare it a fully, fully baked solution, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's no reason why it wouldn't in, in our um, testing so far, it's worked well, but um, it's not been something that we've tested to the degree we have for predictable, but uh, you should be able to use it with both of the current um, eye tracking cameras that Apple have approved. So that, that should both, they should be fine. And actually works probably, it works actually quite nicely because you've got the big hot spots that as your target, target areas. So they could be, you know, half the screen each if you wanted to and have two really large um uh target areas for for eye tracking that would be that would work nicely actually okay so i'm looking through the access uh part for seen and heard and so there's it's there's a bluetooth connection and you can use a head mouse and a joystick um so is it is it mostly a touch based? Is yeah. That, okay. I think really both of the apps are uh, primarily uh, designed first for people using them as touch based uh, apps. Um, but wherever possible, we've either worked within the frameworks of of those devices, so the operating system accessibility setup, um, and where that's not been possible, we've we've created our own. Um, uh, set up within the apps to be able to use um, a, a range of access modes and we have we have features in predictable for example um, that help accommodate for for touchscreen users that might have tremor or um, perseveration like you know locking out the screen for set time so you, that you know that they can um, avoid mishits um, so yeah wherever possible we've tried to um, design it to be a touchscreen at first app which is how we understand probably 95 percent of, of people use it based on our observations okay okay so no switches for the seen and heard um i think probably it would work within apple's um switch framework um it would it, it would their normal um accessibility settings with switches mm -hmm. would work but it has we haven't optimized it like we have predictable where we've built our own sort of in in-app scanning it to accommodate for the keyboard and um yeah but I, i'm sure you can still use it with uh switch access for seen and heard okay that makes sense and so the the best way to get um support from you guys is email is that if yep. you need to contact somebody? Yeah, and we have uh, we have live chat on our website too. So if it's within the, you know, until five o'clock most, so about now, um, uh, most days there's someone online, but you can also leave a comment on the website, on our online chat. And if we're offline, um, someone will pick it up in the, the UK uh, next day in the morning and get back to you. Um, but we, as I said, we have this open, you know, slot every day where we can also troubleshoot, um, or you know, you know, walk you through things if if need be. Okay. Um, and then you you had kind of given me a list of like bonus features right that I didn't have on the matrix and I know that you talked a little bit about those um but I was not familiar with all of them and so I just want to mention them because I don't I want to make sure that everybody else hears about them as well um so the transition to literacy. I know you mentioned that uh, feature, which was neat. I hadn't seen that previously. Um, 
the video visual scenes, uh, the use of uh, AI, generative AI, mm -hmm. and I assume you're talking about the chat GPT yep. integration. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Which again, I think is so cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have the translation feature. We've talked about that a bunch because that is really neat. Um, handwriting input, and maybe I missed it, but... Um, yeah, I did mention that. That's right. So um, for predictable, instead of a, key, a keyboard, or you can switch from the keyboard to a, a notepad on the screen, and you with your finger, you can write, and it will um, trigger the word prediction that way. Okay, okay. Um, I know my, my phone does that. Like, I can write mm. on my phone, and it, and it, it is surprisingly accurate i have decent handwriting though i don't <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that it would work so well for one of my kiddos <laughs> uh okay head tracking input now is that um that it will just track your head right like you don't mm. need a head mouse or something like that on. no exactly yeah i know it just tracks um your um head movements um using the camera on the ipad itself um it needs to be one of the newer ipads and we can, and if you're not sure we can always check let you know which ipads at the, at the time if you if you're wondering um so yeah but you, you can move and you can use that in in combination with those face gestures i mentioned so you could move around with your head and then blink to select for example um on the cell that you wanted okay so using those together okay that that's good yeah um so you have in here floor holding what does that mm -hmm. mean yeah so floor holding is a, a lovely feature in predictable um where you can set up a, um, a series of little messages to keep your turn so um for example might be um just a minute or i'm still typing um and they either play when you tap a button on the keyboard or they can play after a predetermined uh duration after you start typing so if typing is quite laborious um and people are at risk of um interrupting you or wandering off um then these messages can help you keep your turn um and um keep the attention of your communication partner okay uh you know last year we we had a focus on communication partners and how to be a good communication partner and so so important that really is so important to remind people right that it's going to take a little longer than you're used to right exactly <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's a um, for me. It's a an area that's um really important, and um the and finding ways to try to reduce communication breakdown, uh, and then ways to repair it if it does happen, uh, is something personally I'm I'm super interested in. And, um, and there's actually there's loads of when the UK there's loads of research going into that area in general in the field of speech and language therapy, but in, but also within the AAC field. So. I think it's something that we're all thinking about a bit more um, in terms of uh, reducing communication breakdown and and fixing and repairing when it when it happens. Um, I I think it's I think and Kim, you can tell me um, if this is correct. I believe it was you guys that offered a communication partners like training for companies, and then you had like a like a plaque that you could put up that told people that your staff had been trained in how to be good communication partners for for people. I think, we, I, I think are you are you yeah are you thinking about the communication accessibility? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So we're um yeah Rebecca might know about this because that sort of grew out of Australia originally and I think it's done in the UK and Canada it's more that we're trying to <laughs> promote it here in the US um okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's our dream is to get it here yeah <laughs> uh, yeah no it, yeah loads of organizations have done it here you know even I see it sometimes I sometimes see the sticker on the ba on banks and 
public services that they've done this yeah communication access training i think it's it's called or something like that isn't it yeah and i see the logo um yeah and and i think it, and there's a big push here on communication partner training here um it seems to be a, a it seems to be a big push post especially for people post stroke and and people with dementia and um that's a um a big area of interest for me personally as well yeah it's sort of our it's kind of my personal little bandwagon soap soapbox. So I don't know. We we all need to band together and try to get some traction here Definitely. in the United States for it. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? We have a few minutes left. Um, I know there are so 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 many different features, and it is just impossible to to go through all of the all of the possibilities um, yeah. and I think that you've pretty much answered all of my my typical questions um so yay you <laughs> great I can go and have a glass of wine and it's, it's late enough in the day. Oh, it. yes, right. It's five o'clock there now, right? Exactly. Um, it's fine. I can, I can switch off. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh. Um, are there are there any any other things that we can look forward to seeing from Therapy Box? Mm. Um. No, I think Predictable 7, as I said, we're hoping it'll debut uh, debut at um, ATIA in Orlando in at the end of January. So that's exciting. Ooh, are you um, going to be there? I I don't know if it'll be me coming this time, but one of us will be will be there. Um, uh, so we'll see. Um, and yeah, I know we've got some of our collaborative research projects. So it's still early days in the UK. So nothing at nothing. Um, Nothing else in the in the near future that um but predictable seven is 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 um the big one for now. Okay. Well I look forward to seeing whoever it is that shows up. Uh Deb and I will both be there. Great. Good. That's exciting. If it's not me, me, I'll let my colleagues know. Yeah, we'll stop by and, and talk to you guys. Perfect. Yeah. Um, all right. Well. If nobody has anything else, I think we can probably wrap up for the day. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us.